All right, AP World History students, welcome to another lecture for our class, this one covering the Cold War, focusing on topics 8.1, 8.2, and 8.3, basically trying to contextualize the events of the Cold War and discuss some of the causes and, and early effects, kind of the early shape of that event. So let's get into it. 8.1, where we'll start this lecture, is all about contextualizing the unit. Unit 8 focuses on the conflict and ideological struggle known as the Cold War, and the separate but also related issue of decolonization, the wave of independence movements that led to the dismantling of many of the colonial empires and the eventual push from both the USSR, the Soviet Union, and the United States, the two main combatants of the Cold War, to influence these newly independent states to align themselves with one faction or the other. So the important contextual information before starting the talk on 8.1 is this. After World War II, many colonies continued to have unfulfilled hopes for colonial self-government. Places like India, Vietnam, China, much of Africa had started to petition for independence early in the 20th century, like World War I or before. And a half century later, we're still waiting for it. Anti-imperialist sentiment began to grow around the globe with all the rhetoric about beating the Nazis and Imperial Japan to keep the world safe for democracy and freedom. It was outrageous and a little hypocritical to a lot of the uh, uh, colonies that the free countries of the world kept so many colonial peoples in the kind of captivity. Colonial desires for independence became intertwined with this struggle between capitalism and communism as newly independent nations were courted by the USA and USSR or Soviet Union to align themselves with the communist or capitalist struggle. The context for the Cold War starts where World War II ends. In reality, I mean, it could probably be traced even earlier to the Russian Revolution itself, for example, but we'll keep it simple and start with the main issues as World War II drew to a close. First off, the big three is the term for the main leaders of the Allies, the USA, Great Britain, and the USSR, or the United Soviet Socialist Republics, the Soviet Union. They met several times to discuss how to end the war and tie up potential loose ends for the post-war world, Three of these meetings were particularly significant, and you want to know them for the AP test. First of all, the Tehran Conference happens in 1943 in Iran, in Tehran, the capital of Iran. This was just as the war began to turn in favor of the Allies. The main agenda items were that the USSR would focus its efforts on liberating Eastern Europe, and the other Allies, the British, the Americans, would focus their efforts on liberating Western Europe. Part of this uh, conference also involved the Allies agreeing to give the Soviet Union some of the territory it had captured from Poland, um, territory that, by the way, Russia or the Soviet Union had lost when it signed the Brest-Litovsk Treaty that took it out of World War I. So, so um, it's kind of a land grab, but the Soviets also felt they had a rightful sort of claim to this territory. The Yalta Conference took place in February 1945, a couple months before Germany was going to surrender. So it was known that Germany was now losing the war, that victory over the Nazis was now a basically an eventuality, although a lot of bloodshed would still be required to achieve this goal. The Allies began making plans for defeating Japan and reorganizing Eastern Europe in the post-war world at this conference, at the Yalta Conference. The USA wanted the Soviet Union to join the fight against the Japanese and for there to be free elections in the part of Eastern Europe that had been liberated from Nazi control by the Soviets. The Soviet Union agreed to help against Japan on some conditions, mostly as you can see um, if they were allowed to sort of gain control over captured territory in the region. But they were a lot less willing to commit to free elections in Eastern Europe. For a couple reasons, Stalin, the leader of the Soviet Union, worried about another future invasion from Western Europe. And again, this wasn't just paranoia. It wasn't unfounded. 
the Soviet Union or Russia had suffered three devastating invasions at least, each worse from the last, from Napoleon to World War I and now World War II. They wanted the countries of Eastern Europe to basically be puppet states or ideally really close allies that would act as a kind of buffer or barrier between the Soviet border and countries like Germany that had invaded them so many times. They also worried about the U.S. and kind of Western Europe intervening in these hypothetical elections if they did have them um, and trying to sway those people away from a communist or socialist future and towards a capitalist society like the USA, in which case the Soviet Union would once again have enemies at its border, right? So the Soviet Union was not interested in uh, having free elections in these border states they controlled. The last of these big three meetings was the Potsdam Conference, um, which happens uh, also in 1945, um, you know, basically as the war is, is, almost, is almost over, basically, all right? Um, Harry Truman, who was the new president of the United States, once again demanded free elections in Eastern Europe to decide the fate of those countries. Um, Stalin and the Soviet Union, again, just flatly refused, only now they were in full possession of Eastern Europe, all the way to the eastern half of Germany. Their troops occupied the area, and it was very unlikely that the world, or even the USA, was going to be willing to stomach another massive war with the USA against the Soviet Union, just so that Romania and Poland and stuff could have elections. In all the countries occupied by the Soviet Union, communism or socialism, however we want to refer to it, socialism is probably a little more accurate, uh, socialist governments gained control. World War II ending with this kind of conflict and mistrust between the Soviet Union and the USA was the main piece of context for the start of the Cold War. World War II had been by far the most devastating and costly war in world history. In Asia and Japan, many of the richest and most powerful cities and countries were in ruins. In Japan and Germany, for example, Hardly any city had gone untouched by Allied bombing, and many cities had essentially been leveled. As many as 75 million people may have been killed in the war, many of them civilians. The Soviet Union, Poland, and Germany in Central and Eastern Europe suffered the most, each of them losing between 10 and 20 percent of their populations, in large part because that's where most of World War II took place. The conflict between Germany and the Soviet Union should, in our minds now, overshadow all the rest of World War II, right? That is where most of the fighting and deaths happened. France, Great Britain, and, and, and Western Europe also took heavy losses, but managed to maintain strong democratic governments, maintain their great educational systems and prestigious universities, and still were home to many of the world's large and powerful corporations. Western Europe was in a much better position post-war than Eastern Europe, where, the, like I said, the vast majority of the fighting and deaths of the war had actually taken place. Due to the relatively lighter damage and death in the West, France and Britain were able to return as global powers after the war, although they were nowhere near as close to what they had been before the war. The war in general had removed Europe as the center of power for the world and replaced it with new superpowers, the USA and the USSR. So the balance of power had shifted globally from Europe to the United States and the Soviet Union. The USA had suffered the least during the war. We had been one of the last to actually enter the fighting and did not do so until the Soviets had already kind of started to turn the tide of the war in the East. The U.S. mainland saw no significant combat of any kind, although some of our territories or colonies, like Hawaii or the Philippines, had seen conflict. U.S. cities and industries were untouched, and in fact had been boosted massively from government-funded military contracts during the war, giving America this supercharged economy and industrial capability at the end of the war that it did not possess in any way 
before the war started, right? Remember, before the war, we were in desperation in the Great Depression. It was so prosperous that it alone, the United States alone, among the Allies, had money, surplus funds, to invest in rebuilding Western Europe, which we did as a part of the Marshall Plan that we'll mention a little bit later. As we know, the USA had also developed the atomic bomb by the time the war ended, and it dropped two of these bombs on Japan to help conclude the war. For a short time, the USA was the only country with such technology. Although many countries, or several countries anyway, Germany, Japan, etc., the Soviet Union, had nuclear programs during the war. This nuclear solitude of the United States was short-lived, and by 1949, the Soviets developed and detonated their own nuclear bomb in a test. They were now the only country capable of challenging the USA militarily and economically. The war brought more than just destruction, though, and by war's end, the fruits of government-funded research led to many technological improvements outside of the nuclear bomb that improved the lives of millions globally. For example, air pressure for airplane cabins allowed planes to fly much more comfortably at high altitudes. Refrigeration for food became common initially used to sort of transport goods across the ocean. Now trucks could refrigerate milk from, you know, Wisconsin all the way to California or wherever. Stronger plywood was developed for construction projects. A variety of plastics made out of, you know, different kinds of oils came into use. And penicillin um, came into widespread use during and after World War II, kind of the most basic of antibiotics, right? But one that would save thousands, but really, you know, millions potentially of lives between then and now. Following World War II, neither the USA or the Soviet Union wanted another full-scale war, both because of the horrors of World War II and because of the uncertainty of victory in the light of new developments like the atomic bomb. Instead, what's called a Cold War developed. This means that there was no direct military confrontation between the USA and USSR. Instead, the conflict played out through propaganda, espionage and covert operations, a massive arms race, as well as multiple proxy wars across the globe. While the USA and the Soviet Union never directly fought one another, they did involve themselves in a lot of these other conflicts and civil wars, with the USSR supporting and supplying or financing one side, and the USA doing the same for the other side, turning often small conflicts into large and costly ones. The Korean War in the 1950s is one such example, with the Soviet Union and communist China, supporting North Korea, and the USA supporting what would become South Korea. The Soviet invasion of Afghanistan in the 1980s is another example, with the USA supplying the Mujahideen and Islamic militias, some of the groups that would go on to form the Taliban and Al-Qaeda, by the way, with weapons to shoot down Soviet planes, helicopters, and tanks without any actual U.S. soldiers taking part in the fighting. Many, many other such conflicts made up the fighting of the Cold War. These are collectively sometimes known as proxy wars. In the 1950s, both the USA and the Soviet Union further developed their nuclear technology and were able to produce the most powerful, uh, the more powerful H-bomb, or more accurately, a fusion bomb, which was orders of magnitude more powerful than the fission bombs, dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. This was the early days of what would become an arms race between the Soviet Union and the USA, an effort to have more nukes, planes, ships, tanks, etc. than the enemy. In the USA, this led to an ever-increasing relationship with the government and defense corporations, corporations that became more and more powerful and influential as the threat of war with the Soviet Union continued to loom. President Eisenhower, once the general of all Allied forces in Europe, warned against what he called the military-industrial complex, a phrase that has become 
famous <laughs> since he gave this speech. The growing alliance, the, the, the military industrial complex refers to the growing alliance between defense or war industries and the U.S. government, basically explaining that these businesses were in it for the money and might push the USA into conflicts that would be devastating for human life, but very profitable for the people that build airplanes, tanks, and bombs. It is a famous speech, and a quick YouTube search will bring it up. It's worth watching and thinking about, because it still applies today. Finally, we get to the issue of decolonization and how it related to the Cold War conflict as well. As World War I started and ended, imperialism and colonial empires were at an all-time high. As World War II started, there were hardly 50 countries in the world. So many of the world's modern states were part of giant empires ruled from Europe. World War I saw some empires, like the Austro-Hungarian and Ottoman empires, defeated externally and internally, and divided into new nation-states. Between World War I and World War II, calls for self-determination, which is the right to choose your own leaders and government, increased across the colonies of the world, but imperialism continued despite these rumblings. Most of the colonies of the world had participated in World War II, and World War I for that matter, but this involvement in wars that were supposedly for freedom and democracy led to increased sentiments of nationalism and anti-colonialism. World War II had severely weakened Great Britain and France and made it harder than ever for them to maintain control over their far-flung empires and colonies. And more and more, these colonies began to slip from their grasp. The Cold War gave these countries that were itching for independence two potential supporters that they could recruit to help them in their goals, the USA and the Soviet Union, although much of the recruiting typically went the other way with the USA and the Soviet Union competing to align these new countries with one side or the other. Whew. So this gets us to 8.2 on the causes and effects of the Cold War. So to review, we've mentioned that following World War II, the US and its form of democracy mixed with capitalism and the USSR with its blend of totalitarianism at first, anyway, this would kind of mellow later on, and communism or socialism became the two strongest countries in the world, or superpowers, to use a common phrase. After the war, the two countries had expanded their territory greatly. The Soviet Union captured parts of Eastern Europe and exerted massive influence over its satellite states, or buffer states of Eastern Europe. And the USA now had military bases across the world, some gained as part of their arrangement with Britain at the start of the war. Some, like their bases in Italy and Germany and Great Britain, Japan and Korea, they gained through conquest in the war. And when this war ended, the U.S. kept this military presence around the world as the tension of the Cold War grew. So to conclude this lecture, let's examine how the conflict between revolutionary communism and democracy and capitalism took shape in the decades that followed the end of World War II. You can see in here a picture of a nuclear weapon being detonated not too, too, too far from where we're at now. Following World War I, the League of Nations was created as an organization to help maintain world peace and prevent another global conflict like World War I. Obviously it failed, in large part for two main reasons. One, it lacked the support of the most powerful nations, the USA in particular, who despite its President Woodrow Wilson being the main advocate for the League, most US politicians were wary of joining an international organization that would require the USA and others to involve themselves in stopping the spread of conflict globally, right? They'd have to be going out and getting involved in potential wars all the time and also kind of surrender a little bit of sovereignty, right? Like you would have to sort of uh, listen to this international community in a way the United States wasn't prepared to do at the time. So our president goes out and promotes the League of Nations all over the world, and then our own country, his own country, refuses to join, right? It kind of hurts the League right as it gets started. The League was also hampered by bickering and debate 
and was unable to act quickly enough to stop any of the aggressive actions of countries like Japan or Germany and Italy in the years between the wars, making the league seem ineffective because, well, because it kind of was. After World War II, despite already being in the early days of a Cold War, and with massive ideological differences and hopes for the future of the world, the U.S. and the USSR were committed to creating a new peacekeeping organization to replace the failed league. In 1945, the USA, Soviet Union, Great Britain, and China created and joined the United Nations. Eventually, France would join these four, and those five countries would all share the power to veto the actions of the others, uh, and everybody else, basically, that was a part of the United Nations could be vetoed, have their, you know, actions and declarations and, and, and proposed rules be vetoed by these five members, which is really kind of a great display of power sharing and cooperation between rivals. The UN was a place where communications could be maintained between hostile nations, even in the midst of Cold War or Hot War. Ultimately, the UN was unable to prevent tension from increasing, though. In 1946, as the Soviet Union, uh, as Soviet control over Eastern Europe grew, Winston Churchill famously declared that an iron curtain had descended across the continent, representing a more permanent split and divide between the East and West. This divide was enforced by the ideological separation of the two sides. For example, at the core of the conflict was the struggle between capitalism and communism. Countries around the world were so threatened by the communist revolution in Russia that they had sent troops to try and stop the revolution as it was first occurring, right? So the communist revolution, the Russian revolution, starts with the United States, with the Soviet Union, with, uh, excuse me, with Great Britain, sending soldiers to try and stop the revolution from even happening, right? This is kind of a, the wrong foot to get started on, right? But what a threat communism was to the corporations and business interests and, you know, so on of those countries, right? Um, so it was in their interest to go and try and stop it. Um, obviously, they didn't stop the revolution and, uh, and, the Soviet Union became what it was. Successful communism is an existential threat to the industrial capitalism that had come to rule the world since the Industrial Revolution. To review the differences between these ideologies, all right, hypothetically, capitalism is a system where economic assets like machinery and factories and even natural resources are privately owned by businesses, corporations, or even individuals. Hypothetically, again, people can act economically in their own self-interest, right? They can choose the job they want that's going to pay them the most or, or give them the kind of work conditions they want. They can produce the goods they want and set the prices they want to charge for those goods, right? Hypothetically, communism, or more accurately, again, socialism, is a system where the economic assets like the factories, the natural resources, the machinery are controlled not by individuals and companies, but by the state, by the government, which is supposed to be, you know, the people, but isn't really, and used to meet the needs of the greatest number of people, right, without major concern for things like economic profit. Hypothetically, communism or socialism is a system that emphasizes equality and fairness, both socially and economically. Obviously, both systems fall short of their hypothetical goals in many ways when closely examined, which we're not trying to do just right now. The two sides were further divided by the opposing systems of democracy and authoritarianism. The U.S. was a democratic government. Its republic allowed people to participate in free elections and relied on an independent press to provide information that could inform voters. But in the Soviet Union, Elections were weird, all right? Uh, during Stalin's time, for example, the Soviet Union was kind of a dictatorship with no real elections and Stalin more or less commanding most things. By the 60s, 70s, and 80s, though, the Soviet Union had mellowed a little bit with the death of Stalin and become a little bit more, I don't want to say democratic, but 
you know, elections w- were there. Although, again, they were weird and they didn't matter too much. For one, the press was not independent. Um, the press was operated by the government, like everything else in, in the Soviet Union. Um, but, for example, election-wise, there was only one political party, the Communist Party, all right? Basically to ensure that no one could just kind of vote away the whole dang revolution, right? And oftentimes, there was just one candidate for a region selected by the government, and the Soviet citizens basically just got to vote yes or no on that one person, all right? So, you know, kind of silly, but again, it's not like there's no elections going on ever, but mostly it didn't matter, and the state ended up with the candidates it chose for the people. But to be honest and truthful, in reality, there were times when Soviet citizens voted no on a candidate, the only candidate they got to choose, right? And the Soviet government would have to select a new option for them to vote on, right? So not democracy exactly, but not totally a totalitarian system either, but very different from from the kind of real sort of democracy going on in the United States. Both sides also criticized the other for what they saw as internal failings. The USA criticized the lack of freedom for people in the Soviet Union in areas of of religion and speech and economics and government, while the Soviet Union criticized the United States' treatment of minorities, particularly African Americans, who were still uh, legally segregated from white society and subject to all kinds of brutality you are hopefully aware of, uh, throughout World War II and, and even the early decades of the Cold War, right? This treatment continued up until, well, I mean, some would say it hasn't stopped, right? Um, The Soviet Union was also critical of women's rights in the United States and the USA's lack of help for the poor, at least according to the Soviet Union. Both countries were often fearful of the other, and this made a similarity between the two, where the military was an especially powerful and influential organization in both countries. Divided like they were, both sides wanted to spread their ideology and expand their influence, and those efforts made up the battle for influence that we call the Cold War. For the Soviet Union, its focus on its satellite countries, those buffer states that were its close neighbors in Eastern Europe and were on the wrong side of Churchill's Iron Curtain, like Bulgaria, East Germany, which was divided into two parts as part of the World War II peace deal, Hungary, Poland, Romania, were all dominated by the USSR. Their governments operated like the Soviet Union's, and they were essentially old-style colonies in the sense that they could only deal economically with the Soviet Union. All imports and exports came from Mother Russia. The countries also had to join in the Soviet Union's five-year plans, which you'll read about, to rapidly industrialize and modernize which, while sometimes devastating, uh, was one of the major accomplishments of the communist regimes in the Soviet Union and China, is that they do rapidly industrialize and modernize, right, in, in an impressive way. Although often with a lot of famine, a lot of, a lot of uh, unexpected occurrences, right? Internationally, the Soviet Union, since its inception in the, you know, very early 1920s, advocated for world revolution by the working classes to overthrow the capitalist system. In pursuit of this goal, between 1919 and 1923, the Soviet Union supported workers' revolutions in Germany, Bavaria, northern Italy, and Bulgaria. Following World War II, they would support similar movements in Greece, in Korea, in Vietnam, in Angola, in Africa, and other places. This was a clear signal to the West that the Soviet Union had very clear goals to continue to try and expand communism and revolution. From the Soviet perspective, they were just playing catch up with the USA, Great Britain, France, etc., whose military bases and colonial holdings covered the globe. Both were a serious threat and inspired a lot of fear in the other, right? Um... This expansion of communism led to several important U.S. policy decisions that were important to the development of the Cold War. First, the policy known as containment, basically the goal of not allowing communism to spread. This was a change to the other policy known as rollback, 
where you know, the goal was to actually sort of defeat and roll back the borders of communism. But after China, Korea, Vietnam had all become communist, this idea of rollback seemed uh, not only to have failed, but, but unlikely. Containment was about not letting any other countries join the communist bloc. The Truman Doctrine was an associated policy, an associated policy decision uh, first advocated by President Harry Truman following World War II. Basically, it stated that the USA was willing to do almost anything short of outright go to war with the Soviet Union to stop the spread of communism, and that it would provide funds, military supplies, training, weapons, etc., to countries that were trying to resist the spread of communism. This policy led to massive U.S. funding and influence in internal conflicts, excuse me, internal conflicts in Turkey and Greece, and support for anti-communist regimes in those countries. If containment and the Truman Doctrine were the stick that the U.S. used to keep the world from becoming communist, the Marshall Plan was the carrot. Communism has its greatest appeal to very unequal societies, with much squalor and suffering by the poor working classes. The more vulnerable those populations, the more vulnerable a country was to communist propaganda. Following, the World War II, following World War II, Europe was a hot mess, and its economy was in shambles, its cities in ruins, and many of its people were desperate. The U.S. feared that such an unstable economic situation could lead to communist uprisings in Western Europe. So starting in 1947, the U.S. offered $12 billion, close to $130 billion in today's money, to the countries of Western Europe to aid in their economic recovery, Germany included. The plan worked, really, and Western Europe and Japan, who received similar investments, although in smaller amounts, made a rapid recovery. The Soviet Union saw the Marshall Plan as bribery, basically, it kind of was, maybe, I don't know, and refused any of the aid. Instead, choosing to form what's called Comic-Con, or the Council for Mutual Economic Assistance, to rebuild Eastern Europe. It had helped, but was nowhere near as effective as the Marshall Plan had been in the West. But as we mentioned earlier, the damage in the East was far more extensive and far worse than in Western Europe following World War II, and the countries of Eastern Europe had never been as wealthy or developed as the countries of Western Europe anyway. Finally, we get to some of the major developments that really shaped the Cold War. The space race refers to the competition between the two sides to gain access to space for prestige at first, but eventually for the use of more advanced weapons. The U.S. started the space race as losers. The Soviet Union successfully launched Sputnik, a, the first satellite put into orbit by anyone, and this scared the U.S. into action. Because if the Soviets could use rockets to put things into space, the fear was they could use those rockets to each reach any point on Earth with nuclear weapons. The following year, the, the USA successfully launched its own satellite, and in 1961, the Soviet Union would go on to put the first man into space, the cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin, and the USA would eventually kind of win this space race by being the first to put a man on the moon in 1969. The space race, the space race and its rocket technology were closely associated with the ongoing arms race. In 1959, the Soviet Union successfully tested the first ICBM, shortly after developing the rockets that could launch satellites, right, as the U.S. had feared. An ICBM is an intercontinental ballistic missile, basically nuclear-tipped missiles that could reach the United States and just about any other spot on the planet. The need for an air force to actually fly over a city was no longer necessary to wage nuclear war. The U.S. developed their own ICBMs later that year, and a race began to build larger, more powerful bombs to grow the arsenal of ICBMs and high-altitude bombers that could deploy them over enemy territory. Tens of thousands of nuclear weapons of all sizes were built by both sides, 
enough weapons to literally destroy humanity several times over. This threat to the existence of humanity and civilization as we know it became known as Mutually Assured Destruction, or MAD for short. And the idea was that if nuclear war did occur, it was a certainty that neither the USSR or the USA would survive, that probably very few people at all would survive. This was actually one of the main reasons nuclear war has never occurred, this balance of terror, as it was called, the potential for both sides to completely and simultaneously destroy the other, was a, large, was a large part of what prevented the Cold War from becoming a hot war. Lastly, I'll mention the non-aligned movement. As we discussed, the nations that were beginning to gain independence from their colonial masters were not interested in joining the Cold War conflict and wanted to remain unaligned. They didn't want to become puppets or vassals to either side. At the Bandung Conference in Indonesia in 1955, 29 countries, including giants like India and communist China, condemned imperialism and the continuation of colonialism. Kind of in that same uh, sort of vein, I guess, many of these states went on to formally form what was called the Non-Aligned Movement in 1961, a kind of alliance between the countries that hoped to stay out of the conflict. This is actually where the phrase the third world, like third world country, comes from. The democratic kind of capitalist countries of the USA, Western Europe, Australia were the first world. The Soviets and their communist allies like Cuba, China, etc. were the second world. And everyone else, the non-aligned, were referred to as the third world. Although because much of the third world was in desperate poverty after decades of decades or more of foreign imperialism, this third world has become associated more with poverty today than with its Cold War origins. Anyway, those non-aligned countries often had a hard time really remaining non-aligned, though. When one country did turn to the Soviets or the USA for help, its neighbors often quickly received aid from the opposite side, further expanding the battlefields of the war. So, for example, you know, if the U.S., if the... Uh, um, you know, Ethiopia and Somalia had a war, the Soviet Union supported Ethiopia, and so the U.S. supported Somalia in that conflict. And it kind of played out this way across the world in all these proxy conflicts that we discussed previously. This is where we will close this lecture up, all right? Your task this week is going to be researching and presenting on the various topics that make up the bulk and the details, the actual fighting of the Cold War. All right, and we'll hear about those later this week. Thanks for listening. I hope this helped, and I will see you guys soon.